Lisa, hey, how are you? Hello. I'm good. How are you? Doing well. How are things today for you? Things are good so far. It's only 9 a.m. here in New York, yes. so we'll see what the day brings. Yes, I see some sun coming out of the window. Coming sort of. Yeah, yeah, I think it's just a little hazy out, but that's okay. <laughs> That's okay, yeah. Yes. These are great, so I really appreciate the time. Uh, we have a really interesting topic to discuss today. But before we start, for the listeners who don't know you, maybe we can start with a quick introduction about yourself. Sure. So my name is Lisa Sheps. I am a vice president at L'Oreal. Um, I oversee Lancome.com uh, in the U.S., um, let's see, I am a New Yorker. I live in Brooklyn. Um, probably personally hobbies, big traveler, big reader, a uh, big watcher of TV. I think like everyone is these days. And uh, yeah, that's me. Yeah. So what excites you about the industry? I think that you never know what your day is going to be like. I sort of started my career, sort of grew up in store retail a million years ago. <laughs> and when you opened your doors at 10 a.m. or, you know, whenever, you never knew what your day was going to be like. And I do find whether you're running a brick and mortar store or sort of a virtual store, it's that same kind of concept. You never know what your day is going to be like. Uh, I am a true Gemini, and so I like to be active and busy, and, and I, I like that dynamic of the business. Really? It's something that we didn't, we didn't mention in the prep call, because I'm a Gemini too, so... Oh, hey. when's your birthday? May, May 21st. It's not uh, a oh, week. soon. Okay, so you're yes. early. I'm, I'm June 14th, so I'm yeah. a little bit later. I'm yeah. going to turn 50 in another, in another week, so... Oh, Big celebrations, yeah. Yes. I'm just a year behind you then. <laughs> okay, great, great. Yes. Yes. Good. So you mentioned brick and mortar yes. history, right? So, and you talk a lot about the shift of power, right? From yeah. retailers to brands, now with consumers. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So, you know, not that we were alive then, but you look at sort of pictures of retail from the 50s and the 60s, and it was white glove service. And you went to a store, maybe you went to Bergdorf's if they were around then in New York City, you went to these storied um um, stores, and they really told you everything that was going on. And because that's where you found out trends, that's where you discovered new designers. And so that really did stick with us, maybe until the age of the internet. And then there was right. that shift. And the consumer really, you know, you went from department stores, then you went to brands. And now the consumer really dictates what they want, how they want it, when they want it. And so I've always just found it's a really interesting uh, place to be. And as a brand and as a retailer and all of those things, like, how do you manage all of that? And so I, I've always felt um, that that's always just been a really interesting evolution. Still, uh, if we look at the data, still in the U.S., the majority of businesses is brick and mortar, right? And definitely for some industry, it's maybe more than 80%, let's say, in furniture industry or some others. Oh, yeah. How is it for, uh, you know, for, for L'Oreal, for Lancome? How do you, more specifically on your industry, how's this shift has evolved? Yeah, so I think that's very interesting because, again, years ago, you discovered everything at the beauty counter. Those women who worked there really helped you discover everything. And then, you know, brands, a lot of the brands, I think beauty is really interesting because you have these brands, Estee Lauder, Lancome, L'Oreal, you've got these brands that have been around for decades. Um, and then you've got the disruptors. And so it's a really interesting place where you have folks who still come to those those historical brands, and then you have folks who are still going to the new ones. A lot of purchases, first-time purchases, are still made in store. I think now with the rise of TikTok and social media, you really can make that discovery, especially in makeup, because the price point is still reasonable. You can buy something online, sight unseen, sight untried. Um, you can still do that discovery without a big investment. Uh, but majority of purchases are still made. Initial purchases are made at counter, and then sort of that replenishment is made online. Yes, I mean it, it's like the dream for any you know, cosmetics manufacturer, perfume you know, in, in this niche to just go in one of their biggest retail chain. That's like the dream target, even today, right? Because the quantity is overwhelmingly high, yes. right, on retail and counter than on e-commerce, right. and. Uh, 
but uh, it's it gets getting more and more crowded and difficult and the amount of investment and the margin left are questionable and yes so yeah i mean uh, it's interesting that you mentioned tiktok because it was like it, it's an excellent topic because it was like my next question because brands can today launch on tiktok get discovery get conversions and based on deck success they can move to you know over the counter sales and more on the retail yeah. side of things yeah. Yeah. You look at a brand like Glossier in the US, um, they were online and then they started opening their own stores and then it, they went into Sephora. And so it's almost like these D2C natives are finding that they have to or they think that they have mm -hmm. to uh, have stores. But I also think running a store is really difficult and going into some of these retailers, it's a really difficult place too. If you're not yeah. fully, if you don't have the infrastructure and, and your company is not ready to do what that retailer needs and wants. Yes. So it's, a, it's an interesting shift. Yes. Of course, for the big brand, big brands, right? It's a completely different strategy than the smaller yeah. one is because small ones is it's so, so difficult, right? I mean, yeah. these days. Yeah. And again, also on the digital front, you have so many digital channels, right? It's very hard to acquire, you know, shoppers on your own dot com, but yeah. you have other communities like Amazon and YouTube and Instagram and probably, you know, obviously we talked about TikTok and yeah. how do you see uh, all these multi-channel type of, uh, you know, strategies and architecture specifically, you know, for, for, for Lancome uh, in, in this industry? Yeah. It's pretty interesting too, I think, you know, when you think about a phone, that's almost how people go window shopping now. It's how people discover. Um, it used to be Google, then Amazon, and now it's TikTok for, for searching. And thankfully, if your organization is set up this way, all of your channels lead to one big number. And so I've always thought of your brand.com, whatever that is, your flag should be your flagship. That should be the number one place where the customer can get all of the info they need. Lancome mm -hmm. is a French brand. All of our products are in French. And so if you can come to our site and um, be able to find what you need, but you want to buy it at Macy's or you want to get your Sephora points or you need it tomorrow and you shop at Amazon, all of that is okay, again, as long as they're buying your brand. Um, and so if you're able to have your .com be the point of destination, you also have to have the same um, setup and PDP and imagery and titles and all of those little details on your retailer so your customer doesn't get confused. Yes. Um, but as you know, people are going to shop around, especially in the U.S., people are super price sensitive in the beauty world, uh, the customer knows that they can get a gift or they can get samples and they can get something for their purchase. Um, you know, but your brand.com should be that number one place for education. Okay, exactly. So, so education. So, so if we try to split, you know, the, the customer journeys around discovery, research, you know, evaluating alternatives and may, maybe then the conversion, what is the, what do you see the U.S. consumer these days are, are doing in, in each one of those stages? I mean, online versus offline in the, in the beauty industry. Yeah, I think they, they do. They want to come to brand.com for education. They want to go to Amazon for speed. They want to go to store for convenience if you need something that day. We also find we have live chat on site where you can actually talk to a real person, mm -hmm. um, kind of that AI thing. We can get into that too, but yeah. we find people are in store. So either they can't find what they're looking for, they can't find someone to help them. They don't want to talk to a real person. So they're using our live chat to find the product they need in store. So again, this like O plus O, you know, you mentioned customer journeys and, and I sort of hate mapping out customer journeys and I hate marketing funnels because we're so, they say that people have the attention span now that's less than a goldfish. So people are going to get so distracted. These journeys are not linear. The marketing funnel is not linear. Um, you know, so I, I, I kind of wish we would get yes. away from those things, but. And attribution is so difficult. You don't know really so what difficult. happened, right? <laughs> yeah. Google yeah. is changing. Their GA4 is wreaking havoc in our lives. You know, it's just, it's a mess. So why do you think consumers will prefer to place the purchase over the counter versus online? And maybe the other way around as well. Or why in, in, yeah. in, in the beauty industry? I think it's all situational. It depends on what they're doing. I, you know, mm -hmm. I think there's some nuances between generations. 
um, who wants to go into store and talk to people who doesn't. Um, so you, again, you just have to be where the consumer is, how they want to shop, whatever it is, okay. whatever they're feeling in that moment. Um, you have to just be at all those touch points for them. So you, you are think, more, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. So you, you are more on the pull mode, not push. I mean, you, you have an amazing digital experience and amazing yeah. over the counter experience and you just, you just to make, to make consumers happy on both fronts. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Not just. All. Not yeah, not just convincing them probably move online or start online move. You're not directing or you're not you're more no. agile. Wherever and, wherever they want to go. Wherever they want to go. Yeah. Yeah. And people yeah. like to like to shop, you know, in store, right? It's uh Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's like I live in New York City. I personally hate shopping in New York City. The stores are busy <laughs> and they're crowded, but people make trips just to shop here. So again, it's just every single person is so unique in what they want yes. uh, when they're shopping. Yes. And Issa, you've been involved in a lot of digital transformation processes yes. and speaking yes. about offline, online and, and this behavior of consumers, what do you think are some of the best practices or some of the may, maybe the important points people need to be aware of when they're going to these processes? Yeah, I, you know, digital transformation is a tough one for me, you know, even back in, I think it was 2019, when I joined Nike, you know, again, you've got these institutions that are so traditionally brick and mortar. And so you will never digitally transform them, right? Like you will <laughs> never steer Nike away from that. And Nike is having their own troubles these days but they'll be fine. Yeah. Um, but again, like I think this digital transformation idea with these really big historical brands that are still 75, 80% brick and mortar. So it's just, it's, it's what does the digital transformation mean at these touch points, right? So it's maybe a digital transformation at brick and mortar. It's a digital transformation in the mindset of your corporate org organizations. Um, but you've got, folks in your digital teams who don't need to transform, right? Like we are not the ones we are there, but you've got the majority of your workforce who's still brick and mortar, traditional marketing. So yeah, digital transformation is a, is a tough word for me. Yeah. I, uh, I have a hard time with it. Yeah. I mean, and during these processes, you need to have that digital mindset, right? You need to understand that shoppers are everywhere yeah. and everything should start from there and build accordingly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like I kind of go back to my 80 year old dad, right? During COVID, he changed his mindset. He's been a longtime eBay shopper because he collects antiques. But even then, him and my stepmother started ordering their groceries online. So that was almost a bit of a digital transformation. Mm -hmm. We're all there. We're all attached to these things, right? Like if you're 15 or 80, we're there. Yeah. And so sometimes when you're at work and we're using these terms, we're already there. Everyone's already digitally transformed. Apple mm -hmm. has done it to us, whoever, you know, I think the pandemic pushed us to be that way. Um, we've already digitally transformed. So yes. I think sometimes people forget that. Yeah. So imagine your parents moving to shop online for groceries. So those platforms were there in the right timing for your parents. I mean, they yeah. started probably four years ago or five years ago with their processes, yeah. right? And we yeah. see so many retailers these days, they're still brick and mortar focus, right? And the, I mean, the opportunity is so big, right? Retail media and, and everything is just coming up. How can they make that shift? It's a cultural shift. It's a staffing shift. It's like right yeah. in the DNA of these companies, right? It's a yeah. difficult process. I, know, I, and think a lot, I think a lot about Macy's, huge department store yes. in the US. They're going through so much. They have so many stores. I think they're closing more stores next mm -hmm. year. You know, sometimes I almost would love to get into their mindset and really talk about what they're doing and where they're going. I think sometimes we act out of fear and we're more reactionary than we are strategic in how we plan. Um, you know, COVID could have either been a great equalizer or it could have really scared you. And I think some of these retailers like a Macy's, you know, when you even look at Walmart, Walmart is so huge in the U.S., um, and they've done it. Like they still have their great brick and mortar. They've got Walmart plus they've yep. really been able to do it, but why hasn't Macy's right? Like, so it's just always so interesting when you yes. can look at two retailers. It's very interesting. And it's a timing issue. And you see the flywheel that they've built, which is really impressive. Yeah. And on the other side, Macy's, I mean, they've announced not just closing hundreds of, 
of, of, uh, of stores, but also a lot of focus on the profitability of each one of the remaining stores, right? Yeah. So like ba going back to the basics and probably they started too late, right? So for, for, for those who are trying to uh, accommodate the, to the market changes and start on time, what are some of the pieces of data, like the analytics probably side of things that, or, or what are the, the, the business fundamentals that screens, hey, we need to start to change something and take some experts, expertise here and there to, to start doing the transformation? How they can identify that it's time to start? Yeah. I think, I almost think it's not almost within their own wheelhouse when you talk about mm -hmm. KPIs. I think then, yeah. I think in general, in some of the companies that I've worked for, we don't talk about consumer trends enough. We're very kind of siloed in our own four walls. What is our conversion? What is our traffic? What is our, you know, add to cart? What is our foot traffic in store? And so they're very sort of isolated in their four walls of their business. But what are the consumer trends? Mm -hmm. Where's the consumer going? You know, I think if you start at the, with the consumer at what the consumer is already doing, then that will dictate where you should go. And so I almost think getting out of our own little space and looking at the consumer and that trend, that will dictate then what your business model should yes. be. Like being a more customer centric, right? I mean, yeah. and, and we also- all, for... We all say it, right? Digital transformation, <laughs> yeah. customer centricity, but no one, like no one's doing it. <laughs> yes. It's also like two brands in the same product lines even with the same type of personas and ICPs, they probably need to have different strategies. Like not, if it works there, over there, it doesn't mean that it works for me. It's yeah. defi very difficult to understand what, what shoppers really want, right? So yeah. how yeah. do you do that at, uh, at Lancome? And do you have like a survey groups? You work with customer support? You, you, you research every interaction on the website? What are your, the methods that you Yeah, we do all of that. We do oh. MPS scores. We do surveys. We do a lot of social listening, a ton of social listening. I even yeah. read uh, ads on our Facebook, uh, comments on our Facebook comments. ads. Yeah. You can find these places, you can, but you have to make the effort to do it yourself. Sometimes we've got um, internal agencies that will do consumer research for us. But again, I, I sometimes talk to my marketing team and I'm like, well, what do you want when you're shopping? What do you, you know, because someone will say, oh, we need an app. I'm like, okay, but what apps do you use? And they're like, oh, I use Instagram and, and banking. I'm like, okay, so do we need an app? <laughs> Right. Like it's it's I think we we think the answers are, are up here when they're much more closer to home. How are you acting? What are your friends doing? And and I think if you just we want sometimes to have these big, beautiful explanations, but it's really simple. Hmm. Um, but I think social listening, I think surveying your customer, getting out into store and talking to customers. We do a lot of store visits and mm -hmm. uh, folks always report back about what's going on at counter. They talk to the beauty advisors. But then my questions are always, well, who's shopping? Who like what was the atmosphere in the mall like? Was it a yes. Friday at noon and the mall was empty? Go to the mall on a Saturday at two o'clock. See who shop like it's, I think sometimes these things are so simple that we want them to be complicated. Yes. Whatever the, here's the word, the, the consumer sentiment, right? I mean, there yes. are some, like, there, there are really nice AI tools to understand sentiment. I, whether yeah. they're true or not, it, time will tell. But yeah. let's talk about AI. I know you're doing a, sure. a lot around this topic. What, what, yeah. what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. And it's funny, too, because I feel like in the last month or so, no one's talking about AI again. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know if you, you're sensing this too, but we use it mostly for copy um, because of course with a website, we have to have so much copy. And so it just gets a little exhausting. And so we use it a lot for copy um, on site, in email, in SMS. Um, but I do think, I, I think the customer still wants a real person. Sure. And it, so it's a tough one. Yes, yes, for sure. And I'm sure you probably use it for like you mentioned the bot, right? So kind of some of the customer support interaction. I think it's a nice area because you know shoppers knows it's a bot, right? So yeah. they, they are not surprised. They're not uh, like negatively surprised, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, that's an, another area. Yeah, I mean there were yeah. a lot of uh, discussions around AI, but then it, let's let's see what we really works, right? And yeah, you mentioned content. Obviously, it's a major. Uh, uh, you know, time reducer, you know, the idea to, to start initially 
through ChatGPT or other tools and then wrap it up with a human touch. That's obviously the right way to do it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, so technology is very, very important, obviously. And how do you, I mean, in terms of the marketing activities, obviously you're doing so much, right? You do probably ads and some of the influence, influence of marketing. What are the interesting or more exciting uh, probably activities that you are more, uh, more, more excited about in terms of the, your marketing outreach? Hmm. I know that's a tough one. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's anything going on that I'm super excited about because again, I don't, you know, you've seen same. some, yeah. yeah, like you've yeah. seen some of these really cool, I think, um, Lueve had done this where they did sort of those AI generated images of bags going yes. through city streets. Some yes. of that stuff is exciting, nice. but I don't know the, like, what is the consumer impact of that? It's a shiny image versus kind of the reality of things. I do love how influencers and everyday people have become such great champions of mm -hmm. things that they love, right? They're no longer addicted to a brand. I follow some TikToker, TikTokers who talk about like their monthly favorites. It's individual products. You might love a sneaker okay. from one company, a pair of jeans from another. You'll love a moisturizer from another, a mascara from another. And so I think if brands can start to really look at their hero items, what we think our hero items are, what the consumer thinks the hero items are, and then how do we just make sure that they're always top of mind? Yes. Um, you know, the beauty industry is very skew heavy because we have so many shades and all of that stuff. But um, I think hero products, I think if we really stick to a product, you know, I also think like a lot of times internally with marketing, we talk about sustainability. I don't know if that really impacts the consumer shopping decision as much as we think. Yes, maybe for a certain segment of the shoppers, right? Yeah, maybe but I think Gen it's Z. a small segment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Uh, no, I mean that's uh, it's it's really it's really interesting, and uh, I mean marketing is. Uh, do you see any, any change in terms of CPC ROAS? lately or it's still more of the same no it's still pretty good you know where mm -hmm. i am seeing a change um i think there's a big shift in how people i'm not even going to say consumers i'm going to say people um are interacting with email mm -hmm. because we even see it at work right even at work no one's reading their email no. right <laughs> like it's like slack yep. me message me people are going through their emails deleting them all and then we're seeing consumers have that same um habit and so, you know, we're looking at our open rates and our open rates have really declined, but our click through rates are still strong. So, but we're seeing this huge, where CRM and especially email used to be a huge channel for us. And we have much more people, uh, much more uh, subscribers to email than SMS. And in SMS, they really just want an offer. Mm -hmm. um, that's all people want in SMS. Yep. So, yep. You know, I think that's probably a big channel where we're struggling. Yes, I think all all of the brands are struggling, right? I mean, it's uh, yeah. It may we work if there is a big uh, campaign or big coupon code or big discount, right? Sure. I mean, otherwise, just uh, no one cares. That's, yeah, no uh, one that, cares. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the, it's all about. So that's know, a big one. We have to uh, we have to really figure that out. That's going to be trouble. Yeah. When you have some breakthrough, please uh, update us. I know, please. I know. <laughs> okay. So speaking about shoppers and specifically around around Gen Zs, right? So yes. trying to manage the new the new yes. wave of, of employers and they have different needs, different priorities probably. So how the future of work uh, uh, looks I like? Don't, I don't know. This one's a real struggle for me because <laughs> um, even now, right? Like I'm like, I want to be a travel content creator and I want to travel the world and get paid to go on vacation. It's it's really glamorized. Uh, TikTok has really glamorized the content creator, and I think they are fantastic. I'm not taking away from them, but I don't think we can all become content creators. Mm -hmm. And so there is just such a different mindset at work. And I think now, maybe more than ever, you have so many generations. You have four generations in the workforce. And while I'm Gen X, what am I? I'm Gen X. Um but like I'm not married and I don't have kids and I think I skew probably millennial. And so, but I don't have that same mindset. And I, you know, what I think is interesting when you're working, when you're running a website, we are technically corporate employees. And so we work Monday through Friday, nine to five, but we're running a website that's open 24 seven. 
And so on Saturdays or Sundays, when the site switches over, and if there's an error, no one is there to catch it. Mm -hmm. And so then how do you get these young folks who are, are kind of putting up boundaries and saying, I'm not working extra. I'm not going to influence my mental health. I'm not mm -hmm. going to compromise that. And you're like, yes, good for you. And also get the job done. So I think it's just a really interesting dynamic. But the industry is so pressured for results, for KPIs, for numbers, right? Right. Yeah. But this will not, it will never change, right? It will never change. And this younger generation is like, I, I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I don't other, care. Pr other priorities. Yeah. I mean, Lancome as a brand, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you, as, as a target, you're target the you're targeting the millennials, like in general. Well, is, it a good, is it a correct statement? We're trying to to target um, a, a, a younger generations as well. We are trying to attract trying, a younger yeah. generation, but we are for Lancome.com. Our customer is Gen X plus. Gen X plus. It's an older. It's an older yeah. consumer, and a lot of times people discover the brand because of their mom. Mm -hmm. And, but we are, but I, I don't want to target Gen Z. Gen Z is not coming to Lancome.com no. yet. No. They're not there. I want yeah. to target millennial. We are a higher price point. Yes. Um, and so even if we brought in 30 year olds, I'm not bringing in 20 year olds. They're not, mm -hmm. they may want to use our mascara, but they're going to discover it on Amazon Ulta or Sephora. Yeah. And that's okay. Yes. So you mentioned yeah. like hero products and it's yes. also relevant for hero market segments. So also yes. like let's make the strong stronger, yeah. you know, where to focus and try to entertain the new generation that's comes coming up, right? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Exactly. Interesting. Yes. It's all interesting. Lisa, what else? Uh, I know you're doing a lot of things outside of work, like mentorship, uh, volunteering. Yeah. I think, you know, I've been pretty sort of fortunate in my career. I've been working for a really long time. I have walked out of a job. I'm not proud of that moment, but I mm -hmm. had said, I've had enough, left my badge on the desk and I walked out, right? Wow. So <laughs> I've had these sort of scenarios before. And so now I love, you know, I had a mentor mentorship call on Friday with a young woman. Um, and I love to speak to folks. I used to do a lot of volunteer work in New York City mm -hmm. with folks who've come here from other places and thought that they had to take sort of lower level jobs or, you know, those folks who are like, oh, my English isn't that good. Mm -hmm. I don't want to apply. And I want to encourage those folks like, no, we need you in the workforce. Your English might not be that good, but you actually speak four languages. And that's amazing, right? Like, I want to work with those folks and show them and, and help build their confidence. So that's always been something that's super important to me. Interesting. So it's more towards those who are like looking for their, uh, their first job and like the younger generation. So it's like a one-on-one -on -one -one mentorship, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or even folks who are second generation, you know, like I had parents who really pushed me. Mm -hmm. um, you go to college, you apply to college, you look for your resources, mm -hmm. but if you're second generation and your parents didn't, you know, their English isn't great and they don't know the resources. And, you know, I've worked with some young folks who come out of college, really high GPAs, and they're so lost. They don't know what to do next. And so work with them on LinkedIn, worked with them on elevator pitches, even their voicemails on their phone, right? Like wow. you come out of college, you're going to start applying for jobs. People might leave you voicemails on your phone. Your outgoing message can't be like, yo, yo, what's up? It's Doug. <laughs> like, you know, like it's those kinds of, where they didn't even think about that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so where is fun. the passion to help, you know, those individuals? Why? Again, I think just because I was lucky and I worked hard and I had resources and you, and you think about all the people that maybe don't have that. And so then how can I just give that back? Wow. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And in terms of your career, what's next for you? I don't know. I've been thinking about that a lot. <laughs> I think like you said, you know, I'll, I'll be 50 next year. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when, when you've got less time ahead of you to work than behind you, consulting has always been a big, I love the startup sort of mentality and, and people who are starting, you know, brands in their kitchens. And, and I would love to start doing some of that work. Mm -hmm. Um, also, a little side thing that I've always wanted to do, I've started taking classes at um, GIA, the Gemology Institute of America. Um, nice. I want to design jewelry, which is sort of a weird sort of transition, but I love jewelry. I love jewels. Um, so I, I think that's part two in my career. Okay. 
Is it something yeah. new? Is it something that you, you're passionate about? I'd say always? in the last like five years or so, I've really developed this passion and started taking classes. Um, ideally, I would really love to travel the world, find vintage jewelry out there, bring mm -hmm. it back and sell it. Okay. That's what I want to do. So we have an announcement here or is it just yes. a thought? <laughs> yeah. We'll it's see. Not... We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great, Lisa. So how people can find you? Yeah. So I'm on LinkedIn. You can always reach out. Um, yeah. So happy to chat. I always, I believe in karma. So if someone reaches out to me and wants to chat, I always get back to them. Yes. You're very open, very friendly and very, you know, happy to chat. So it's yeah. really nice. Anything else you want to add, Lisa? No, I think that's it. I think, I think at the end of the day, you know what, we're going to be okay. Everything's yeah. going to be okay. I know there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot going on. But if we just kind of look out for each other, we'll be okay. Good. Lisa, it was a pleasure. Very yes. interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.